Relatively recently, there was a really intriguing study that focused on the concept of runaway greenhouse effect. The idea behind the phenomenon where a planet reaches a certain temperature, where all of the greenhouse gases start to accumulate practically exponentially, indefinitely warming up the planet until it becomes completely uninhabitable and extremely hot. And this is of course a really important concept for us to study because of our neighbor, Venus. Venus is a good example of what happens to a planet when this effect occurs and the planet loses all of its water, becomes entirely covered in various greenhouse gases and remains extremely hot with extremely high pressures of atmosphere for basically billions of years, potentially indefinitely. And so extremely recently, French scientists conducted one of the most accurate simulations in order to discover, so okay, Earth, can this happen to our planet? And if so, how? And they did make some really intriguing discoveries. And so today we're going to discuss some of the results and what this means for our planet, but also, I guess, talk about some misconceptions as well. And very quickly, let's start with that. I think the word greenhouse gas, because of political implications, today is basically misused for a lot of different misconceptions. And that's because usually it's associated mostly with carbon dioxide released by various industries. But in reality, pretty much most gases can be greenhouse gases to some extent. Methane is obviously a very powerful one, we discussed that in one of the previous videos in the description, so are nitrogen oxides, and so is water vapor. And water vapor is a really important one because it actually increases the overall strength of other greenhouse gases and does have a much wider absorption spectrum compared to everything else. Here's actually another way of trying to visualize this, and it basically shows us the amount of absorption based on the wavelength of light. And as you can see, water in this case has a very wide absorption spectrum. This will become important later on. But today we're not really talking about the climate change, we're not really talking about the human contribution to any of this, we're not discussing anything political. We're talking about a much more, I guess, dangerous scenario that we know is going to happen eventually, but the scenario that the scientists want to understand more, because the question here is, okay, hypothetically, can Earth actually reach the same conditions as Venus at some point, and if so, what exactly would need to happen to the planet in order to achieve this runaway greenhouse effect? And so. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, let's discuss this somewhat hypothetical and somewhat intriguing scenario that answers this question to some extent, with the study actually discovering that apparently it would not take much for Earth to turn into Venus, and it might have almost happened a long time ago. But I guess first, let's start with the obvious. It's extremely, extremely unlikely that even if we release all of the carbon dioxide stored in fossil fuels, we'll ever be able to reach these conditions. And so no matter how hard humans try, we're not going to be able to turn Earth into Venus, at least based on calculations from fossil fuels and from carbon dioxide. And even with the extremely high levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, which has happened in the past approximately 400 million years ago, we're just not really going to get there yet. Here's actually a graph showing us that carbon dioxide levels were very likely at least 10 times higher than they are today for a pretty long time. And during that time the temperature was very likely close to about 40 degrees Celsius on average. Today it's only about 13 to 14 degrees. And naturally we know that Earth survived this and did not become Venus. But all of these older models mostly focus on carbon dioxide for obvious reasons. Basically just to establish if fossil fuels could one day lead us to this. And so some of these older models usually ignored other gases, while also generally using a much simpler one-dimensional models. Ok, science time. In scientific terms, the runaway greenhouse effect is also sometimes referred to as Komobayashi Ingersoll limit, essentially representing a limit when the planet can no longer lose enough heat and instead keeps accumulating heat on the inside, inside its atmosphere, becoming hotter and hotter over time. And we know that for Earth, theoretically, this limit is going to be reached when the Sun starts to emit approximately 10% more luminosity or basically becomes about 10% brighter. This will most likely happen approximately 1 billion years from today, with the average temperature on the planet finally reaching approximately 47 degrees Celsius, 117 Fahrenheit. And it's actually once we reach these temperatures where things start to transform extremely rapidly. And at this point, it's not carbon dioxide or even methane that becomes a problem, it's actually water. Which is exactly what this new study focused on. Here they were able to simulate the runaway greenhouse effect by focusing on what happens when water starts to evaporate from the surface of the oceans, and specifically focusing on the main effects that are going to be driving these extreme changes in the environment. And so it turns out that as soon as we reach this temperature of about 47 degrees Celsius on average, 
which is obviously going to be higher in certain locations, lower in other ones, a slight increase in evaporation from the surface of the oceans will suddenly dramatically increase the greenhouse effects from the water, thus increasing evaporation even more, leading to more and more water accumulating in the atmosphere as various types of clouds. And this is actually the first time ever that the scientists focused on this transition stage itself, trying to see what exactly happens to the planet as it goes from being habitable and having a liquid ocean to basically becoming Venus, with one of the main discoveries suggesting a formation of very unusual clouds that will very likely form around the entire planet and potentially permeate the entire stratosphere, creating a kind of a layering effect, practically allowing no heat to escape. And these super dense clouds that will suddenly even appear much higher in the atmosphere will basically begin an irreversible greenhouse runaway effect. By dramatically altering the atmosphere and continuously increasing evaporation from the oceans, this basically begins a process that is impossible to stop. It causes the planet to suddenly acquire a much higher atmospheric pressure, a much higher content of water vapor, and most importantly, an extremely high greenhouse effect. All of this driven by a large amount of surface ocean that existed here for billions of years. And after evaporation of only 10 meters of surface water, the atmospheric pressure would actually double, very likely leading to temperatures of over 500 degrees Celsius within a very short period of time, potentially just a few hundred years. And at this point, this is completely unstoppable. The ocean will continuously evaporate, add even more pressure, create even more extreme conditions, and basically create the planet completely void of water with an extremely thick gooey conditions on the surface formed by highly pressurized water vapor. With the final temperatures and final pressures very likely being approximately 1500 degrees Celsius and approximately 273 atmospheric pressures. All of this occurring in possibly just under 1000 years. And so once the planet reaches these extreme conditions, that's basically it. It's now technically primordial Venus. But because all of this forms a very thick layer of water vapor, now all of this starts to interact with the sun, beginning the new process of photodissociation. The H2O molecules will fall apart and create hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen escapes into the rest of the solar system, oxygen very likely forms something on the surface or potentially creates more CO2. And this begins the next stage, the so-called second stage known as dry transition phase. Here the water will slowly disappear but over time become replaced with CO2 and possibly a few other gases. At which point Earth becomes a slightly more extreme version of Venus because it does have slightly more carbon to create carbon dioxide. And this study once again confirms that this is exactly what probably happened to Venus a few billion years ago. Because it's much closer to the Sun, it started to lose its ocean, it reached the Komobayashi Ingersoll limit much quicker, and its water started to evaporate much quicker as well. And there's a lot of evidence for previous existence of water here because of an extremely high deuterium to hydrogen ratio in Venusian atmosphere. It's about 150 times the amount we see from planet Earth, and it suggests that heavier isotopes, deuterium, that very really likely came from the oceans that used to exist here, are still lingering in the Venusian atmosphere. But one thing that makes Venus different from planet Earth is that unlike Venus, Earth does have plate tectonics, at least for now. And so that's why Venus has so much carbon dioxide on its surface, because it mostly never got to go inside the planet, with volcanoes constantly releasing more carbon dioxide into the Venusian atmosphere. But a lot of carbon is trapped inside planet Earth, and so for at least some time, the carbon dioxide levels on planet Earth are going to be pretty low. As a matter of fact, once all of the water vapor disappears, there might even be a period when the planet might become possibly slightly cooler and maybe even somewhat more hospitable again. But because plate tectonics at this point might actually shut down as well, constant volcanism and constant geological activity will eventually release more and more carbon dioxide as well, and so at some point it will go back to being super hot again. But this will take hundreds of millions of years and possibly even billions of years, and so there might be a very intriguing period on the planet after it loses its water vapor when it's actually kind of empty on the surface, but possibly not too hot. But during this water vapor stage, it is going to be super extreme. As a matter of fact, it's going to have extreme everything. Extremely powerful wind speeds, very thick atmosphere that's not going to allow any light through, and super pressurized, super hot, and quite exotic conditions right on the surface. And so yeah, modern climatology studies definitely imply that our planet is not going to stay the way it is forever. It might have maximum 1 billion years from today, 
And after this, things will actually escalate pretty quickly. But this study also provides us with some really important implications in regards to exoplanets, as well as reminds us of how precious and how unique our planet is after all. Too little greenhouse and it becomes a nice bowl, too much greenhouse and it becomes a heated sauna. And so for billions of years our planet managed to maintain the balance between the two, allowing life to evolve. Why and how, that's of course a question nobody can answer, but that's why the scientists are trying to figure out if something like this can also happen somewhere else out there. For example, it might have happened on Venus back in the days, there might have been even life there, and so maybe it can exist somewhere else. And so one important discovery from the study are these very specific detections and these very specific signatures of the clouds produced during this period. These very unique water clouds produce very specific patterns that could be detected with modern telescopes. And so by observing a planet and its atmosphere, it might become possible to determine if this is happening somewhere else. For example, one of the planets in the TRAPPIST-1 system. We know that the closest two planets seem to have nothing on them, no atmosphere and no liquid water, but there are still five planets to go and discovering something around those planets would be super exciting. Hopefully we'll get to hear more about this sometime soon from the James Webb. For now though, we don't really know what's going on there. With the other important discovery, basically suggesting that it looks like our planet almost reached this point back in the days. The overall discovery here suggests that you only need about 47 degrees Celsius on average to start this irreversible process. And as I mentioned before, millions and even billions of years ago, the average temperature on the planet might have approached 40 degrees Celsius. Not so far from that limit where it could have begun an irreversible destruction of everything on the planet. And that means that there were at least a few times historically when the planet was just a few degrees from beginning this really really powerful process. If planet Earth was a little bit closer to the Sun or if the Sun was just a little bit hotter, it would have started. But because we know it didn't, it just once again confirms that our planet is maybe just a little bit too lucky. And if you want to learn more about this concept of rare Earth hypothesis, check out one of the videos in the description. And so at least for now that's kind of all I wanted to mention in this video, but I'm definitely going to follow this up with some other discoveries and additional investigations focusing on various climatology studies in regards to hypothetical scenarios on planet Earth. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who loves learning about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support the channel on Patreon by joining channel membership or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow and as always, bye bye.